A cinematic tribute featuring the world's top skater, Kurt Browning, burning up the ice, daring, dynamic, with Jose Twinar, Christy Yamaguchi, Browning at his best, an all-star skating special. You must remember this on CBC, Sunday, December 11th. Meatballs, My American Cousin, I've Heard the Mermaids Singing, Jesus of Montreal, Black Robe, Naked Lunch, all award-winning Canadian films, and I wasn't in any of them. Join us for the 15th Annual Genie Awards. The best is yet to come. Isn't that right? Tuesdays, Bill, Paul, and Jackie Barron keep a sharp eye on the marketplace. The Power of Cashton, coming December 14th, presented by CBC Edmonton. Rallying around block leader Lucien Bouchard. Newt's world. The United Nations is literally incompetent. The new power in U.S. politics. Sunday Reports with Wendy Mesley. Good evening. Lucien Bouchard is getting better by the hour. Slowly, the Bloc Québécois leader is coming back from the illness that cost him his leg and almost cost him his life. It was during the worst moments of his ordeal that Bouchard wrote a message. And as Kevin Tibbles reports, that message is spreading. Inside a cramped and smoky room in downtown Montreal, Quebec sovereignists gather to present an award to their Patriot of the Year. But before that... Le plus grand patriot. The speaker calls for a show of support for someone in hospital just a block away. Monsieur Lucien Bouchard. People at the back of the room are busy signing get well cards for the Bloc Québécois leader. I said, don't, don't stop fighting. Don't, don't stop fighting. Bouchard remains in intensive care at Montreal's St. Luke Hospital. He is still listed in serious but stable condition, but is now eating solid food. Everywhere there are signs of support. Across the street facing the hospital, a banner reads, Coulon continue. These are the same words Bouchard wrote down and handed to his doctors following his surgery. It may have been just a short phrase scribbled on a piece of paper, but in just three days it has become much more than that. Coulon continue, or let's carry on, can be interpreted several different ways, and many sovereignists have decided it will have a political meaning. Now, small posters that carry the phrase are plastered on light standards throughout downtown Montreal. And it is already being chanted at sovereignist rallies like this one. Filmmaker Pierre Falado says he's fascinated how the message has now become myth. When you are a leader, uh, sometimes you, you, just, you just write... Uh, three words on a piece of paper and it it becomes a, a message and uh, I don't know may, maybe it's that, no, that this is magic magic these sovereignists want to capitalize on in the months leading up to a referendum but it did not help them get through the hospital doors when they arrived to deliver their cards and good wishes to Bouchard's room so they delivered their message verbally from the driveway Kevin Tibble, CBC News, Montreal. Our panel will have more on this later on Sunday Report. In other news, Serb forces in Bosnia today released some of the UN peacekeepers they've been holding. A total of 53 British and Dutch soldiers were freed. They had been held by Serb forces in eastern Bosnia for about a week. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's a warming up. Uh, of, of the situation from bottoms up and there must be some very happy chappies about The Serbs continue to hold 55 Canadian soldiers despite a promise on Friday to release them immediately. Meanwhile, diplomats are trying desperately to end the fighting in Bosnia with a negotiated peace. Today, the foreign ministers of Britain and France were in Belgrade to float a new proposal. It's one that could give the Serbs a greater share of Bosnia's land than the 49% they were offered before. Serb forces already control more than 70% of Bosnia. 
The Bosnian War will be item one on the agenda in Budapest this week. World leaders, including Prime Minister Chrétien, are gathering for the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. And as the CBC's Don Murray reports, Bosnia isn't the only area of disagreement. Boris Yeltsin arrived smiling this afternoon, despite the fact that his country is very much the odd man out at this summit conference. Three days ago, his foreign minister objected strongly to NATO plans to eventually include Central European states. Russia wants the CSCE to be the key European security organization, with far more power in a UN-like Security Council, where Moscow will have a permanent seat. But Western leaders, like Jean Chrétien, have quietly but firmly rejected the Russian plan. Canada, the US, and the Europeans prefer the CSCE the way it is. A talking shop, a diplomatic debating club, not an organization with any teeth. With leaders from most of the 52 member states arriving, Hungarian authorities were taking no chances. Police were everywhere in the capital. The center of Budapest will be virtually sealed off for the next two days. During that time, the conference will debate and approve a document outlining European security needs in the next century. But like a messenger of grim reality, Bosnian President Ilya Izabegovic slipped into Budapest tonight. The war in his country is brutal testimony to the failure of the CSCE and of NATO. Canadian peacekeepers in Visoko are still being held hostage this evening by Bosnian Serbs leading the offensive against the enclave of Bihać. But Foreign Affairs Minister Andrei Wallet said Canada wasn't yet ready to endorse ideas for a quick pullout of UN troops. I still believe that uh, there is chance for peace. We ought to renew uh, the effort in order to bring the party to a, a peaceful solution. War and peace in Bosnia will dominate discussions and private conversations at this conference. But the only role that Western politicians see for the CSCE in this conflict is one they call preventive diplomacy, which is to say in the circumstances, no role at all. Don Murray, CBC News, Budapest. Newt Gingrich, the new U.S. House Speaker, said today, diplomacy is not the answer in Bosnia. He called the United Nations completely incompetent and said he would threaten the Serbs with sheer military force. That kind of talk is pure Gingrich. He's now the most powerful member of Congress and anxious to throw his weight around. Our Washington correspondent, David Halton, has more on the man and his views. This is truly a wildly historic night. Indeed, it was historic. And more than anyone else, it was Newt Gingrich who made possible the biggest Republican victory in Congress in 40 years. Suddenly, Newt Gingrich is the man everyone is talking about here, arguably now the most powerful Republican in the U.S., and certainly one of the most belligerent. His previous incarnation was really as a, a parliamentary Fidel Castro. He was a, a guerrilla leader. Guerrilla leader, pit bull, bomb thrower, the former history professor from Georgia has been called all of those names since he was first elected to the House of Representatives in 1978. That year, Gingrich advised his fellow Republicans to get, quote, nasty with their Democratic opponents, advice he's followed ever since. How are you doing? I'm Newt. In the campaign for this month's election, for example, Gingrich recommended that liberal Democrats be called corrupt, incompetent, and sick. And he blamed them for creating a welfare state that he claims is destroying American civilization. You can't sustain civilization with 12-year-olds having babies, 15-year-olds killing each other, 17-year-olds dying of AIDS, and 18-year-olds getting diplomas they can't read. It was Gingrich who was the architect of the Republican election platform, the so-called Contract with America, that candidates were asked to sign in September. The contract commits Republicans to a radically conservative program, much more spending on defense, much less on welfare, a balanced budget, big tax cuts, all to be voted on within a hundred days of a new Congress convening in January. Nor, Gingrich now says, will there be any compromising of what he calls his conservative revolution. And that means we have to say to the counterculture, nice try, you failed, you're wrong. Nor in victory has Gingrich been any more conciliatory towards President Clinton and his wife, whom he describes as elitist 
out of touch, he says, with normal Americans. If Democrats were angered by that remark, they were outraged when Gingrich promised last month to cut all welfare benefits for single teenage mothers and to put their kids in orphanages. We will fight that as hard as we can. We are not about tearing away babies from their mothers. That is not what the American people voted for. Nonetheless, there is now a strong tide of public opinion in favor of deep cuts in welfare spending, as well as other Republican proposals such as fewer taxes and smaller government. And the new reality here on Capitol Hill is that only an extensive use of the presidential veto can prevent the Republicans from implementing what some are already calling Newt's Revolution. David Halton, CBC News, Washington. In the breakaway Russian Republic of Chechnya, there are growing fears of an invasion by the Russian army. Russia has threatened to move into the Caucasus Republic to end its bitter civil war. Russian tanks and troops were on the move today as part of a continued buildup near the Chechen border. In the Chechen capital, Grozny, hundreds of volunteers took an oath to defend the Republic. Chechnya has also accused Russia of arming opposition forces trying to overthrow the government. More passengers and crew from the ocean liner Achille Loro have reached land safely. But there's word a third passenger has died on one of the rescue ships carrying passengers and crew to shore. And there's more remarkable video from on board the ship. These pictures were shot by Achille Loro passengers. They show people breathing through wet towels as smoke poured out from a fire below decks. And the evacuation seems painfully slow. Many of the passengers, elderly, made their way down rope ladders. From jammed lifeboats, passengers watched as the ship lifted further to its port side. The Achille Loro sank last Friday. A via rail passenger train was sideswiped today by a freight car. It happened at a rail yard in Kamloops. The freight car derailed and hit two of the passenger cars. No one was hurt. In Quebec, Cree leader Matthew Kuncom has emerged as a leading critic of the PQ government. Sovereignists were outraged when he called some PQ policies racist. But the controversy hasn't stopped a tour of Cree lands by the Federal Minister of Indian Affairs. Here's the CBC's Paul Adams. People here in Waskaganish say their community is 20 or 30 years ahead of Cree reserves outside Quebec. But when the Grand Chief of the Cree, Matthew Kuncom, brings the Minister of Indian Affairs, Ron Irwin, to visit, there are complaints as well. Down there. Four-year-old elder lives down here. Lives in the basement? Lives in the basement. Keeping, flooding. This is junk. You know, this is not good, okay? But you guys have come a long way. Oh, yeah. Despite great progress here, the Crees still look to Ottawa for help of almost every conceivable kind. <laughs> this elderly woman jokes she wants the minister to cure the blindness in one of her eyes. <laughs> In Waskaganish, there's housing that needs to be replaced. A sewer system that dumps into the same river from which drinking water is taken. So when the tide comes in, all the raw sewage goes back into our water intake. Minister the chief, Billy Diamond, says Ottawa needs to move if it wants Cree support in the debate over Quebec sovereignty. Crees have to see tangible results and changes in the administration of their affairs before the uh, Quebec referendum. I think it is important that we meet. This week, Ron Irwin helped to cement the Federalist Alliance by offering to appoint a negotiator to speed up action on their concerns. The Cree insist they have a right to remain inside Canada even if Quebec chooses to separate. That's led some to think of them as staunch allies of the Federalists in Ottawa. Matthew Kuncom says it's more complicated than that. I'm not in a federal camp, matter of mind, uh... Quebec camp, I mean the Cree camp. But at least Ottawa accepts the Cree's right to opt out of a sovereign Quebec, which the PQ government in Quebec City definitely does not. The fact is, while Kuncom escorted the federal minister through Cree territory this week, he's so far failed even to arrange a meeting with Quebec Premier Jacques Parizeau. For now, the Cree clearly believe there's more to be gained from the Federalists in Ottawa 
than the sovereignist in Quebec City. Paul Adams, CBC News, Ujabugamu, Quebec. When we come back, we'll look at how the Lucien Bouchard story may affect the political debate in Quebec. Worth billions tonight on Venture. This is all about young boys with acne. The knock them down corporate battle for video game dollars and seeking millions. A Newfoundland boot company is trying to woo London's teens. Coming up on Venture right after Sunday Report. I think uh, that's uh, the good news for all Quebecers because uh, Chien Bouchard, for me, is a friend, is a great man. And we have, we need it. Such an important personality has got a contribution to make to Canadian political life. Uh, even though we may not be on the same side. He represents a certain continuity with uh, Mr. Lévesque. So, in fact, he represents greatly, he's uh, practically a legend now for the sovereignist movement uh, here in Quebec. Some thoughts on Lucien Bouchard's remarkable ordeal. As we heard earlier, the BQ leader is improving, but he faces a long and difficult recovery. To talk about the impact this may have on Quebec politics, we're joined now by our panel. In Montreal, Michel C. Auger, an Ottawa correspondent for the Journal de Montréal. In Ottawa tonight, Globe and Mail columnist Jeffrey Simpson. And the CBC's chief political correspondent, Jason Moskovitz. Well, we usually devote this panel to a discussion of political issues, and we really debated this week how appropriate it would be to talk, or to keep talking, if you will, about Lucien Bouchard's brush with, de with death. Jason, what, what do you think? Is this an important political story? Well, let's begin by saying uh, this is obviously a matter of sensitivity for everybody. Uh, we are not doctors. We have no idea what the psychological effects of uh, this grave uh, disease can be. Uh, we don't know if he's going to be in shape to fight a referendum. Having said all that, with all the sensitivity that it requires, there is no question that the politicians themselves are doing their calculations. And uh, the sovereignists, you heard in that clip, uh, talking about how Bouchard is now legend, like René Lévesque. The message that he wrote his doctors, uh, let's continue. Now one can interpret that, that he told the doctors, continue, continue to do what you have to do. And already the nationalists are interpreting this as the great message to the people to continue the fight for sovereignty. Uh, there's no question that uh, Lucien Bouchard was very well liked in Quebec before this. And I'd like to begin mm -hmm. this discussion by raising the question, is he now not loved? And what effect could that have during a referendum campaign? Jeffrey, what's your view on this? Has, has his illness changed things politically somehow? Wendy, I have great difficulty answering your question. Columnists are supposed to have opinions on everything. And uh, <laughs> on national television, you're not supposed to say what I'm about to say, which is I haven't got a clue. I feel in responding to your question like the butt of the old joke about journalists that they don't have anything to say, but they have a platform to say it. There are far too many uncertainties to enter into any kind of an intelligent commentary about what will happen six months from now or eight months from now about whether Mr. Bouchard will or will not have a great impact on the Quebec referendum. My own view, uh, not so much about that, but about politics in general, is that Canada wasn't built by one person and it won't be destroyed by one person. Michel, you're in Montreal watching uh, the Mouvement uh, Souverainiste, which is a group of, of hardline sovereignists that use that slogan, the let's carry on slogan of Mr. Bouchard in the street today. Uh, what do you think? Is this becoming more than a personal story of grief and a political story? Well, I think it shows the deep, uh, the deep emotion people are feeling, but I don't think that le, that Que l'on continue will make a very long history as a political slogan. This was clearly a message to his, doc to his doctors, and, uh, you know, the, uh, at the end of, of everything, uh, this will not be uh, the determining factor in the referendum campaign. Uh, the, 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 what is now happening is a personal tragedy for Lucien Bouchard, and basically uh, whatever decisions he has to make about his political future, about his involvement in the referendum campaign, are very much his own and his family's, and, uh, and uh, let's leave it at that for now. Explain for us, though, the incredible outpouring of emotion that we, that we saw this week. Could this have happened in another province, or is there something special about this man's link with the people? 
system. I think I think he's he's, he's the best politician uh, in Quebec right now. It was true before his illness. He was the one who who had the most direct connection, if you want, with people. Uh, and and uh, he was not only popular because uh, of, of any kind of movie star quality. He was also the fact that he could convey emotion, he could convey explanation of the sovereignist message better than any other politician in this province. And, uh, of course, sovereignty is also about emotion. It's not only a, uh, a balance sheet thing. Uh, and this is why there was so much emotion about, uh, about him. But uh, I must say that I was also quite surprised to see uh, uh, the outpouring of emotion from the rest of Canada also on this. And, Jason, I mean, could that have an impact? That, that emotion is brought, almost affection was shown in the rest of the country towards this man this week. Well, Wendy, in terms of the rest of the country, I think that the biggest loss for the sovereignists at this early date is the fact that Lucien Bouchard was becoming a respected in many ways and more and more credible spokesperson for sovereignty in the rest of the country, that he was not the kind of individual that uh, Canadians so easily got their backups, and I'm not speaking for everyone here, I'm making a general statement, that his message was being more and more received that... Uh, kind of uh, intellectual level in the rest of the country, which was always his goal. And it seems that there is no simple or easy replacement anyone in the sovereignist plant, anyone in the sovereignist camp who can fill that role now. Uh, Jeffrey, I know you don't want to play uh, crystal ball gazing, but obviously Mr. Bouchard is going to be somewhat sidelined for the next few months. That's got to have an impact, doesn't it? Yes, but it's impossible to know how. Uh, clearly, in the House of Commons for the next uh, three months, the Bloc Québécois will be somewhat less effective than when he was there because the media does prefer to concentrate on personalities, particularly in the false combat that goes on in the House of Commons, and they don't have a personality that is equal to him. But I pick up Jason's preamble to his first remarks. We don't simply don't know when he will return. We don't know in what psychological condition he will be in. We know he will go through a great personal ordeal to recover his health. I'm mindful of the fact that Franklin Roosevelt was president of the United States for many years, uh, and he had polio. He was handicapped. Mm. But I also remember that Franklin Roosevelt was psychologically devastated after his polio, and he took many, many, many months out of the public arena in order to get the capacity to move back into his arms. We simply don't know how Mr. Bouchard will recover from this illness and what shape he will be in when he returns to the public limelight. Well, I guess the, the next step in the referendum campaign, we should see on Tuesday, Michel, uh, Mr. Parizeau and his advisors were meeting today to go over that strategy. What should we expect? Will there be any changes? He said that the timetable, for example, won't be changed. Well, you won't get a date from that strategy, for one thing, and, uh, and it's basically a, a broad and very broad plan about uh, how the Quebec government, its allies, will go into this battle. So, uh, uh, in fact, they don't need to change anything in that broad strategy because of Lucien Bouchard's illness. Uh, well, what about, for example, there had been this battle between Mr. Perizeau and Mr. Bouchard about what was called the Solemn Declaration, uh, saying that Quebecers uh, want to separate even before uh, they get that mandate in a, in a referendum. Mr. Bouchard had, had pressured the Premier to back off from that. Will we see that, for example, on Well, Mr. Mr. what Mr. Bouchard was saying that the, was that the Solemn Declaration should be part of the referendum process and should not be introduced in the House as soon as the House was called back. The House was called back last week. We haven't seen the Solemn, solemn Declaration, so Lucien Bouchard won that point. Uh, you know, uh, so, so uh, do not expect very many uh, things from that strategy on Tuesday and, and do not expect changes because of Lucien Bouchard's illness. I don't think that's that kind of document yet. What well, will you be like, go ahead. Well, I'm not sure because Tuesday, as I understand it, and Michel can correct me, I think that the government of Quebec is going to announce the creation of and the mandate given to a committee that will move across the province to try to design a constitution for a new Quebec, or at least how a new Quebec would be politically organized. And they've taken their cue from the very successful Bélanger Campo Commission that was set up in Quebec and toured the province after the collapse of the Meech Lake Accord. I have always thought that the Parti Québécois is a group of men and women utterly determined to win their objective, having been defeated in it once before, and they've learned from recent history. And they liked the Bélanger Campo exercise because it was televised across the province. It brought people together in a way that few commissions do. It produced a report that was generally favorable to sovereignty. And I think they will use this exercise again. And this is something I think we can intelligently comment about because we've seen it before. We've seen how effective it was before, 
And I'm sure the Pawtuckabic well will try to repeat that effectiveness with this commission. Jason, last brief word to you on how things may or may not have changed and what you'll be watching for in the next little while out of Quebec. Well, one very concrete development which you touched on is the fact that uh, Jacques Parizeau doesn't have Lucien Bouchard to contend with anymore, and I'm sure that Parizeau would much rather have Bouchard healthy, of course. But the fact is there were several disagreements, very important disagreements, and the Bloc Québécois was Lucien Bouchard. And now Jacques Parizeau is on his own. There is no one of a strong view from the Bloc Québécois who can question Jacques Parizeau's strategy. All right. Well, on that point, we'll stop speculating and see what happens. Thank you all very much for participating this evening. Good night. You're welcome. Thanks. And that's it for this week. I'm Wendy Mesley. Peter Mansbridge and Pamela Wallen will be here tomorrow night with CBC Primetime News. But stay with us now for Venture with Robert Scully.